Hey, folks. So I'm here with anarchist playwright Brenton Langle, my longtime friend who the viewers are familiar with. And this time we're actually joined by a disembodied voice. Uh, Bob. Hello. 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 Right. <laughs> uh, Bob is a ghost who will be joining us. I'm just kidding. He's a he's a guy who, uh, who doesn't have his webcam on and he'll be joining us as well. So there'll be three of us. You'll only be seeing two of us, which is interesting. Should be a fun stream. And we're going to be talking. I believe it was Brenton had the idea of talking about the concept of fascist infiltration. So since this was Brenton's idea, why don't Brenton, uh, you know, kick us off? Sure. Um, and uh, before uh, we head off, I just wanted to plug my friend's band here. Uh, they're called the Dog Park Dissidents, and they gave me the single most radical shirt that I own. And I own a shirt with Vladimir Lenin on it <laughs> that says, I told you this would happen. But they are a uh, left anarchist furry uh, punk band. And I highly recommend if that if that sounds like it's up your alley, go check them out because they rock. Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, this was something that uh, Bob and I, Bob of the 5x5 Five Five podcast, uh, I met him through uh, the Communist versus Libertarian debate group. And um, uh, he wound up coming on Modern Day Debate with me, and he's the guy that did the debate where we worked with um, – uh, uh, we, we debated the two Christians on objective versus subjective morality. He did an excellent job. Uh, brought up Adorno quite a bit, if I'm not mistaken. He, uh, and that one, I was Hegel. I think uh, I came on your show and I brought up Adorno because I'm, I'm, I'm legally required to bring up depressing continental philosophy in every conversation I have. Yeah. <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, I had asked Caleb if he could join us for this because we're both part of this forum and I moderate a number of forums uh, across Facebook. And um, lately they seem to have been targeted uh, for fascist infiltration. It hasn't been the most sophisticated fascist infiltration, but it's been obviously a coordinated and concerted effort. And B Bobby, do you want to describe this for the for the listeners? Well, you know, it, it's the standard thing that you're going to deal with pretty much in any space you're on in the Internet now because there's a mobilized kind of uh, – I don't want to say weaponized. Uh, it might be too, giving them too much credit uh, – movement of far-right people who are, are basically spamming every space that they can get with their so-called ideas and uh, lack of rhetoric. I'm sorry. There's a car driving by. I hope that didn't mess you're up fine. the audio. Yeah. Outstanding. Uh, but – it, yeah, you, we're starting to see the Pinochet memes. You see the, you see the uh, standard, uh, far right talking points. The 1530s. You see the very veiled, uh, very veiled racist arguments. You see them uh, posting uh, dog whistles or sometimes outright just fascist imagery. And it, it's funny. And uh, I was really interested in coming on with uh, Brenton, and then I found out about you being on here too, uh, Caleb, uh, to discuss where that comes from and what we can kind of do to. To combat it, because because what what kind of got me about this whole thing is you know I've done art organizing in meat space and I've done organizing in uh, online, and um, the the fascist right uh, in a lot of ways scored a lot of points in online organizing um, you know in 2016 uh, with a lot of stuff coming off of 4chan and websites like that, and what was interesting about the, these infiltration attempts that they seem to be coordinated. Uh, they seem to be spamming a lot of like the LGBTP memes, like the where they tried to claim that uh, the LGBT community was allowing pedos in, and now we should you know go together against this, which is a, a straight up like dog whistle. Like there is evidence that they planned this and are using it and have been using it since like 2016. Um, so like, but of course, you know, there's a, there's an element of them coming in and saying, hello, fellow leftists. And, you know, they'll claim to be libertarian socialists. They'll claim to be Marxists. They'll claim to be all kinds of communists, but it's very clear that the posts that they are making one, they don't understand the terminology and two, um, they're very clearly for the purpose of identifying and recruiting people that don't recognize their dog whistles. So it got me thinking like, you know, they got dunked on pretty hard by our forums, but how many forums have they tried this on where the, they aren't so quickly recognized? Um, so I thought we'd talk about that. And I thought we'd talk about like fascist infiltration, you know, in meat space and in organizing history. And, you know, you're the guy to go to for leftist history, in my opinion. So, um, you know, what's your takeaway from hearing a lot of this? Because this is a very recent version of it. But, you know, it, this has been going on for a long time. Well, you know, it's interesting when I was first getting involved in political activism, 
in the United States. Uh, I was, you know, I was like 19. It was like 2006. The Iraq war was a big issue that people were protesting. Um, and uh, there was this thing called the movement. Do you folks remember the movement? It was like the old hippies who did, you know, peace rallies and, you know, protested around kind of leftist issues and could remember the 60s. And I remember that that there were like John Birch Society kind of people, like mm. people that that, you know, were on the far right would try to enter, uh, would join, like there was something called the Northeast Ohio Anti-War Coalition. And a guy who called himself a libertarian would come to every meeting. Um, and then the guy would bring with him a magazine called American Free Press, um, which Google American Free Press, um, you know, in the back, they would have ads for, you know, Holocaust denial material and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And, and he would hand it out and he would just be like, I'm a libertarian and I'm part of this. And I remember you know, some of us that were like more hardline communists actually raised to the group. They said, this guy is far right. He's tied to white supremacists. He's all of this. And the response of the group was kind of like, you know, not everyone's a communist. You have to be tolerant. He's a libertarian. Sure. And and they were wildly tolerant of this. Um, and it wasn't until like some younger anarchists actually like pitched a fit that they actually finally asked him to leave the group. Um, and that was, I experienced that. The other thing that I remembered was- Solidarity, that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that I remembered was that there was, um, there was, you know, it would seem like overnight, you know, these anti-war rallies we would have, it would always just be in Cleveland, the same small group of leftists, you know, who'd been protesting since the Vietnam War. There'd be younger people who'd come around and, you know, but it was mainly just the same nebulous. Out of the blue, there would be a whole bunch of like younger libertarian guys with Alex Jones DVDs. And they would just have stacks, like huge <laughs> stacks of Alex Jones DVDs to hand out. Yes. And, you know, these wars are caused because of 9-11. 9-11 was an inside job. You got to watch this. I first heard of Alex Jones before he like went mainstream because I had been at anti-war rallies and gotten DVDs shoved into my hand uh, before. And I would then take these DVDs home and watch them. Um, and realize. I'm sorry. That, <laughs> I'm sorry you went through that. Yeah, Thank you for your I, service. I, I'm pretty sure that's a war crime in a few countries. <laughs> right, <laughs> like yeah, forcing yeah, somebody to watch Alex Jones. I would watch them, and I realized this was not left wing material. This was right wing material. You know, the world is run by the secret Illuminati that controls the Federal Reserve and the lizard people, and they're all communists. And what we need is real capitalism and rise up against the commies and free America from the United Nations globalist conspiracy. And I was saying, this is ideological poison. I took this to the communists that I was working with, and their response was, oh, yeah, but, you know, people think this kind of confused stuff. This is what people think when they're, you know, before they realize that communism is the answer. And this is just normal. This, there was, like, no reaction to it. And I remember when Ron Paul got to be very popular on my college campus, I was saying to people, this is dangerous. This is ideological poison. Um, and a lot of these old leftists, they just didn't get that, right? It was kind of like, well, these people are against the wars, so they're on our side. They're good. And I kept saying, like, no, like, wake up. We've got a problem here, folks. Um, and what disturbed me the most was it was like people, I would see people that were just like normal conservative Republicans who liked the wars, thought that torture was good and all of that. Um, I would see them wake up and suddenly realize the government was lying about the wars and all of that. But they would wake up wrong. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> they would wake up and say the answer was, the you know, the USA is communist. We need real capitalism. George W. Bush is a neocon, which means he's a communist because of Trotsky or something. And we need real capitalism back and check out Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. And and it was weird. And I was kind of I was the one raising the alarm about fascist, you know, far right ideas were kind of being normalized in left wing circles because they were seen as being against the Bush government and against uh, against uh, the wars. And and I was kind of raising the alarm and I was upset. And mainly I was upset because this was an ideological question. Right. And that there needed to be ideological. This was this was an ideology these people were pushing. This was they had a far right worldview that needed to be combated and building the movement and, you know, just just, you know, having bigger rallies. And that wasn't going to going to solve the question. And there was like not much interest in it. So now, you know, and then during Occupy Wall Street, I remember having these arguments. There were like these kind of people. I don't know if you remember this, Brenton, that, that would walk around. There was a woman with like, you know, she would have the hammer and sickle crossed out and she would have Obama Hitler mustache. And she had like a, a Tea Party flag and she would walk around just like she was part of Occupy Wall Street. And I remember <laughs> I, I would confront her and be like, that's awful. You know, and people would, you know, Occupy people would surround me and be like, look, dude, not everyone's a communist. OK. And it was like always it was like you're trying to like not accept people that are not communists or something. I'm like, no, these are far right people. And there was just this tolerance. There was a whole Ron Paul contingent, I believe, at Occupy. They had like love, revel, love, 
revolution or something and revolution and, with the, the the yeah it's spelled love and right revolution generation and and wall street are all communists and you know that kind of stuff was kind of widely tolerated in occupy and it was like it was almost like it was like it was like if you argued against it you were being a, a stalinist tanky trying to take over the movement like it was like it was almost like they were being protected on many occasions i almost felt like by arguing with those folks, I was like, I was, I was breaking the rules of Occupy or something. It was weird. So then fast forward to now, now it's the complete opposite. Now in left-wing circles, we all have this checklist of things you're not allowed to say. And we're all like, a lot, like there's a fascist under every, under every rock, under every, every bush. And anyone who disagrees with anybody on any social issue is somehow a fascist. Um, and that there is this vast fascist plot and, because of this vast fascist plot, we have to vote for Joe Biden. And if you don't vote for <laughs> Joe Biden, you're secretly working for Donald Trump and you're part of the vast fascist plot to undermine American freedom or something. It's like we've done a complete 180 and I'm still kind of somewhere in the middle where I don't think the movement should have been tolerating fascists back then. And I think we should have been debating them and exposing their ideas back then, not just assuming that they'll go along with it or they agree with the cause or whatever. I think that was, you know, the right answer back then. And now I'm saying we need to cool our heels here and find out what's really going on, argue against backward ideas and figure out where people are really at. So I, I'm, I'm kind of in this weird uh, in this weird place in between our two moments where I feel like in both moments, we've kind of gone to extremes that are not good. Does that make sense? Mm, makes sense to me. What, what do you how do you feel about that, Bobby? So. I, I, I agree broadly on what you're saying. And I think what we have to realize is where these people are coming from and what causes them to uh, accept these far right ideas or what causes them to you know, go to Ron Paul in the first place, which is obviously if you read his old his old insane newsletters that are basically making eugenics arguments and endorsing fascist policy. Supposedly uh, written uh, by Jeffrey Tucker in his name, by the way. Yeah, and he published it. So, I mean, it doesn't make yeah. it better. Oh, you know? no, I'm not, I'm not saying. I'm, oh, I'm no, I, I, I know. <laughs> oh, I know. I mean, I know. I mean, it, it makes it worse that he was associating with somebody that awful, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the fact that we get all of these guys who are on the far right now, I think, is a symptom of a really weird uh, moment that we're in with the far right culture industry that we have in this country, where uh, we have a couple of generations now, I would argue that the boomers kind of started it, of people in America that broadly don't understand ideology when it hits them right in the face. So they don't see fascism, they don't see communism, they don't see socialism, they don't understand what neoliberalism is, they don't understand um, pretty basic economic concepts, uh, they don't understand um, their class position. And so when you get them exposed to these far right ideas, they find them very appealing because they have, uh, provide a very satisfying emotional release. So you get your Gamergate uh, neo-Nazi type guy, right? Uh, he doesn't really understand ideology. He doesn't understand the system that's kind of immiserating him and making him poorer than his parents. Mm -hmm. And then he's told that uh, these uh, mythical SJW leftists are coming for his video games, which is his last little corner of the world where he feels in control and you know all it takes is a few spicy memes to get him thinking about these things and he doesn't recognize that it's far-right ideology he thinks it's the natural course of the world and you get a lot of these guys that you find on online spaces especially i think yeah i ran into a few usually like um there was a comic artist that i met uh, who I liked, you know, we were talking in a bar and I was actually like, hey, you know, you should pitch some of your stuff to Scout. This looks pretty good. And he was like, oh, you know, I'm thinking about it and, and stuff. And then uh, a couple drinks in, he starts talking about like Alex Jones and Stefan oh. Molyneux. And he, I was trying to be like, you know, that guy's a Nazi. And um, he was like, no, he's a, he's a classical liberal. Uh, I think fascists really... Um, exploit. In fact, they've even gone on record. I think Unicorn Riot exposed a post uh, from one of their channels where like the guy was sitting there like literally talking about how, you know, um, leftists will recognize their dog whistles, but never reveal your power level. You know, don't say that you're a Nazi. Leftists will get this and call us out, but the normies won't listen to them. Yeah. And the times that I have met 
uh, fascists in various forums. Uh, you know, if it's a forum of communists or anarchists, we recognize the talk very quickly and shut it down very, very quickly. But you jump into a normie political Facebook group and you try to point this out to like a boomer libertarian or a regular Republican or Democrat, and they think you're crazy. And the fascists will actually use that to try to argue that you're insane and um, like just gaslight you. Like there, there was a forum that I was on, literally the guy had the motto of Auschwitz on a picture on his, uh, like, like, like the work will set you free in German. Um, oh, yeah. On his pickup truck. And I'm like, dude, 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 this is, this is the picture of the pickup. Truck. This is the meme he shared. It's the, it's the thing from Auschwitz. And they're like, well, you know, some people just, you gotta, uh, you gotta understand that some people just have free speech and we just gotta let them talk. And I'm yeah. just like, my guy, and this this dude, knowing it, then went to his other fascist friends and started bringing them in one after another, one after another, into this forum. And by the time I left, like there was a size a sizable contingent of fascists that were just spamming their memes, and all the boomers in this group had no idea what was going on and wouldn't listen when I tried to warn them. Yeah, you know that that happened to a Fallout group I was in. Uh, there was a spicy Fallout uh, meme group called Fallout Rad posting. And it started off as a legitimately funny thing, and then people started letting in far right memes, and now it's basically a Nazi group because uh, yeah. they'll, they'll eventually they'll just take over. And uh, the part of that too is a symptom of the weird neoliberal moment that we're in, where we're kind of I don't want to say the word nanny state, but we kind of live in a society where it's it's considered uh, like the height of uh, social faux pas to be rude to somebody or to be mean to somebody. So even if somebody does have Albrecht macht frei, um, and I don't speak German because I'm an ugly American, um, I'm an ugly American disembodied voice kid, sorry. But uh, it's considered rude to uh, call them out on that. It's considered rude to be mean to somebody. Uh, it's kind of a perversion of um, Popper's um, tol Paradox, Paradox of, of the Tolerance Society, yeah. Because people don't actually read Popper and they don't understand what his conclusion is. And you know that's another symptom of us not... Uh, creating a society that's uh, steeped in the quote unquote culture that the fascists say that they're defending, which is also kind of the height of irony of the modern far right movement is that they say they're defending this grand tradition of culture, but they have no idea about any of the ideas that have been transmitted by that culture over however many hundreds or thousands of years. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask you, Caleb, by the way. Um, so I remember at Occupy and I, I don't know who this guy was. It might've even been Jason Kessler, but when I went down to uh, pr protest the DNC in, in Charlotte's uh, in like 2012, um, like I went down there with uh, Paul DiRienzo and John Murdoch. And while we were in the park, there was a guy who said he was like a national socialist with us at Occupy. And he was a feminist, but only for Aryan women and, and crazy shit like that. And, you know, we, we ran him out. Um, thank God, because, you know, I'd, there were people taking it. And then, you know, luckily uh, there were some black block anarchist kids who, when they heard that, were just like, kill. <laughs> and so I was able to wrangle some of them over there. And then the, the he was thrown out of the park. But, you know, how should we go about identifying and dealing with these people? And how should we make sure that we're not doing it to people who can be reasoned with? but, you know, maybe just are misinformed on a lot of issues. I think the first thing that has to be done is you have to be very clear about what we're talking about. Because I, I, I've been in so many situations where, I mean, for example, I would say the majority of Trump supporters are just confused. You know, I mean, they're confused for whatever reason, you know, but what this crowd that you're describing, these people that have Auschwitz memes that say the Holocaust never happened, that are white supremacists, they would say they're white nationalists, they're fighting for European civilization. What yeah. that crowd banks on is, you know, the reason you talked about how they isolated you is they bank on kind of the disgust that Trump supporters have for everyone calling them Nazis. Right. And so, they, you know, you see somebody who clearly is a Nazi. Right. And you, and you call them out on it. <laughs> And then they go, oh, see, he's just like your teenage son calling you a fascist. See, aren't you sick of this guy? See, I'm the victim. And, and, and they, they, they play on that. And that the, the use of Nazi as a pejorative for anyone who disagrees with me about anything or anyone who's to the right of me on any issue kind of creates an atmosphere where if everyone's a Nazi, nobody's a Nazi. Um, 
one weird story I heard, and I actually heard this from from somebody who is on an email list that some Trump supporters are on, is that when the Charlottesville demonstration happened, right, a lot of Trump supporters, apparently there was wide invitations going out, like every Trump email list ever was inviting Trump supporters to go to the Charlottesville rally, which was a white supremacist. David Duke spoke there for Christ's sakes, right? Yeah. And some Trump supporters actually realized what was going on and said, no, this is Nazis. We should not do this. You know what I mean? And other Trump supporters said, oh, they call everyone a Nazi. So that's meaningless. And that there was like a big debate on these email lists of some Trump supporters saying you should go to Charlottesville, some of them not saying it. And that there were also some Trump supporters who went to Charlottesville, didn't know what they were getting into, saw the fights breaking out and thought, we're getting out of here. We thought we were just trying to save a monument or something. And, you know, and that people, you know, I, I, I'm disgusted by Confederate monuments, but there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that are confused. Um, Probably, I think, one of the biggest problems, you know, John Oliver, I like some of his material, but his piece on Confederate monuments, it had one big flaw in it, which is if you watched it, you would think that the Confederacy was good for white people, right? The Confederacy, you know, it's like kind of this notion that, yes, the Confederacy was awful for people of color, uh, but white people benefited from slavery. So they should recognize that it was bad and, and feel bad for people of color. Leaving out the fact that that, you know, the Confederacy yeah. for white people was a disaster. Right. And that, that white people in the South, because they were competing with people who worked for free and were worked to death, uh, that, that they had low pay and that the Confederacy was bad for everyone. And the way the Confederacy was defeated was through building solidarity. Right. And that seems to be, you know, solidarity has always been the way to defeat fascist and racist hate is, you know, this this notion that racism hurts everybody and that that, yes, we need to prioritize the most oppressed communities, those who are, are, are most victimized by it, but that, that fascism and racism and all these things have really always hurt everyone in the working class. That kind of idea is something that I think people that might be confused can be won over with. But when it becomes a blame game where it's like, okay, you don't agree with me about this or you don't know enough to, to, dis to agree with me about this, because I mean, we can't count on, uh, you think people who go to U.S. public schools are going to understand the history of racism in the United States? You think people who go to U.S. public schools, well, I mean, even our universities, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of anti-racist discourse and stuff, but, but you really, we can't count on the existing apparatus to get people to understand the real history of racism and class struggle in this country. So, you know, the, the antidote has always been solidarity. But this this kind of this atmosphere where it's like you disagree. Well, you're a Nazi. You're no better than Adolf Hitler. You know, you, yeah, I mean, it, that 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 atmosphere creates creates really a lot of room for real Nazis, real fascists to gain sympathy with people who wouldn't otherwise support them and to recruit and to have other people come to their defense out of pure confusion. Am I on to something or am I off? I think you are. I think you're onto something. But also, I'm going to point out it's not just public schools that seem to conspire in this. Like I went to a uh, private school uh, in high school, a very ritzy one. Um, I still have no idea how my parents afforded it. And uh, when I went there, um, one of the speakers at this school brought on was Christina Hoff Summers. Like, who's that? Christina Hoff Summers. She is. Do, do you want to explain her, um, Bob? Yeah, she's she's a, a far right uh, person who masquerades basically as an econ uh, economist. Uh, and a she's, feminist. Yeah, and a, fem and a quote unquote feminist. Yeah, she she's one of the pillars of the um, proto intellectual dark web quote unquote movement. She's she's basically an a she's basically an anti feminist neoliberal um, apologist who who, yeah. couch who couches her neoliberal apologia in uh, um, anti quote unquote SJW discourse. So she, she's one of those ones that you would have been talking about a minute ago where she builds sympathy when people protest her. She's saying like, oh, look, they're protesting my ideas because they want to oppress me. Uh, oh, look, they're uh, protesting my ideas because they want to shut these uh, truthful, truthful arguments down, basically. Yeah. She, 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 she's like she's in the um, Sam Harris Sargon of a cat kind of uh, category of quote yeah. unquote YouTube intellectuals. She did. She was called like the gamer gators called her mom. Apparently, oh, ba uh, based mama was based her mama. Jesus, I hate these people. <laughs> it, it, so it, 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 it's frustrating. It's frustrating when you see people get um, put down that pipeline, who mm -hmm. are otherwise reasonable people, and you know that they're getting put down that pipeline because they don't understand basic economic or philosophical concepts. But that, then they start. Yeah. Then well, they start down that line. 
Well, what I remember, so I came back from uh, like my semester at this boarding school and she had done the speech. I might actually do a video about this because she had done the speech um, and what she had essentially said was, was that like, I was a feminist, but the feminists just got too crazy for me yeah. and, you know, they hate men and here's what they're doing. And they're trying to destroy masculinity because they associate masculinity with violence. And she used as her example, um, this book that this supposedly feminist book that had been put out where you did stuff like um, you played instead of playing tag, you played this game called like circle of friends where someone got tagged and then to unfreeze them, people had to surround them and say good things about them and circle them. And you know, all the teenage boys are laughing at this and thinking it's ridiculous. Well, I took that home to my mom and I was telling her about this. And my mom was like, I thought you were a feminist. And I'm like, well, no, I, until feminism got too crazy because I was just repeating yeah. what I'd heard. And I, I mentioned like the examples that she gave about um, masculinity being under attack. And my mom being a, uh, being a former special ed teacher said, that's not a feminist book. That's a special ed game. <laughs> what Christina Huff Summers had done was she had taken stuff that were from literally from uh, textbooks and stuff that were meant for dealing with people with like severe, severe autism, um, you know, uh, mental disabilities and tried to pass it off as feminists pandering and trying to destroy uh, patriarchy. So, so like these people are just liars there. And, you know, but there there's a very big environment for them yeah you mentioned sargon of akkad who i had my debate with um recently and went pretty well in my opinion um also yeah sam harris is another is another big one and then you, it goes all the way down to these like shit lords that show up on um the our forums and try to sp spam pinochet memes while claiming to be a left libertarian yeah and it, it, it's funny too because uh oh i'm sorry caleb i think i interrupted you you looked like you were about to say something no, I mean, you can go ahead. I'll, I'll speak afterwards. I, I have an interesting reaction. That, that's an interesting anecdote Brent just raised. But, but yeah. no, 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 I, I lost my train of thought anyway, man. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, no, I, I guess what, what occurs to me is, you know, it, that's a really nasty lie, right? Yeah. But I can see why it's effective because it taps into a certain kind of male resentment, I feel like. And increasingly, you know, like male, uh, male kindergarten, male elementary school teachers are in very high demand, um, you know? And I think that that in the early elementary school years, you know, boys, you know, for whatever reason, they're socialized or whatever to be more aggressive, you know, to, you know, write stories about knights and castles and swords and stuff. And and that there is kind of a because there's such a, a dominance of female educative figures, there is kind of a rejection of that. And I think every every male um, I, I can't speak for you two, but it has an experience of maybe feeling like their maleness or their you know, gender expression or whatever has been somewhat rejected by an educational system that is a little bit more, more, you know, you know, we, we don't say knife at school. We don't say gun at school, kid, you know, you know. And right. so by telling that lie, she was like tapping into some resentment that I think that crowd they all had. I mean, that men have. I mean, that that, you know, and it's it's a lie. Right. I mean, that's ridiculous. Tag is something that goes on all the time. No one's trying to outlaw tag, you know, and all that. Yeah. But by saying that she was able to pump up, you know, and that's the thing, you know, the, the, they talk about the like the worst lie has a grain of truth. Like she was tapping into feelings people already have. Like people would believe that. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. of resentments that they already have. Like one thing that I one thing that's a really big theme um, among these alt right kind of people is they are under the impression that women go around falsely accusing men of rape all the time. That yeah. doesn't happen. It happens every so often. OK, but rarely, rarely are there false rape accusations. Those are very, very rare. However, however. Many guys have experienced, they ask a girl out, she says no, and then she goes to her friends, not to authorities, not to police, but to her friends and says, oh my God, can you believe that creeper just asked me out? You know, oh, I think he was sexually harassing me. And then the guy feels just a huge amount of shame and anger about that. So then he gets on the web forum and they're saying, yeah, women falsely accuse men of rape all the time. And he says, yeah, and he identifies it with the rage he feels about something. That's completely different, right? You know, I mean, how, do women do mean things to men sometimes? Of course. Do they go and falsely make false rape allegations? Very, 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 very rarely. Um, you know, but it's like, again, it's like if you tap into resentments that people actually have, 
you can then get them to believe things that are false. Does that make sense? Uh, that seems to be a common tactic these folks use. No, yeah. it, it totally makes sense. Sorry, it, Bob, go. Oh, it does. I had a similar experience to what you uh, had started talking about uh, when I was going to school. Uh, I, I boxed from when I was like 12 to uh, when I was in my mid-20s. Uh, pretty seriously, and you know, I'd you come and I'll to have to spar one day. By the way, oh, oh man, yeah, hell yeah, man, we'll we'll go. Um, I'll get you a beer and a cigar after I knock you out. Um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, I'd come to school with bruises all over my face, and you know, I would get looked at really funny. Uh, I was very fortunate in that that experience really made me very secure with myself as a person and my masculinity. But you see, people tapping into that weird resentment. Uh, Jordan Peterson is another guy who's. I would say definitely on the alt-right pipeline, or he was until you know he destroyed his brain with benzos. But uh, he he tells a story where his kids uh, couldn't throw snowballs in school, mm. and it, when you dig into it, it turns out that some kid threw a rock and a, a snowball at some other kid and like gave him a shiner, so the school banned snowballs. So you're right; it does it does always kind of come back to a little bit of a lie to push their far right agenda. And it comes back to the resentment that people feel growing up in a really weird moment in history uh, uh, where we're culturally coddled in a way and uh, not exposed to uh, really uncomfortable thoughts about ideology or about the broader system that we live in. And they can tell these easy lies and it gets people going down this pipeline. So you start off with Christina Hoff Summers, you start off with Jordan Peterson, you maybe you start off with Ben Shapiro if you have really bad taste and like hearing people talk really, really fast. But, uh, and then, you know, it, it, it's, it's an obvious pipeline. It's a documented pipeline from these, I, these far right ideas to accept yeah, American Johnson non-compete does a great video on this. Yeah, he does. Uh, I, I love that video. But uh, and and I, I've seen it happen to people too, and it's the weirdest thing because they're adopting these ideas that are so antithetical to the values that they claim to hold, and to and that will not actually give them a material or even an emotional solution to the problems that they claim that they have with uh, current society, and and I think the the solution to that um, is 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 vigorous public debate. And just to crush these awful ideas as much as possible uh, so that people don't go down this pipeline. If, if Jordan Peterson, instead of being like the cool kids philosopher or a New York Times bestseller, was lambasted for being a, a failed right wing sophist who misappropriates and doesn't understand the fundamental ideas he's talking about, then he wouldn't be such a big factor in the alt-right pipeline. If people understood what the actual ideas of the Enlightenment were – they wouldn't go down the far right pipeline that's claiming to defend the ideas of the Enlightenment, but is actually very antithetical to those ideas. Uh, they wouldn't be uh, adopting um, libertarian Ron Paul style arguments to fix the problems of neoliberal capitalism when their solutions that they're they're advocating really vigorously for are just going to make their problems infinitely worse if they're if they were adopted. Yeah, and, a lot of them have already been tried. I mean, you talk to the ANCAPs mm, like. Mm. They they want they want to privatize the police. I'm like, what do you think the police were yeah, before? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like this, before we got off too much on a, on a tangent there, I did want to bring this back because Caleb, you mentioned like uh, playing on insecurities all the way from elementary school. I actually remember because one of the things Christina Hoff Summers brought up in her speech to my school that I remember to this day was that there was a boy who had been asked by his teacher to make a collage. Um, about a woman that he um, uh, admired. And he chose a famous tennis player. And in this collage, he put a knife because um, she had been stabbed. Oh. Mm. And so he puts the knife in there and the school freaks out and he gets in all this trouble for glorifying violence. And she said, well, no, he felt his masculinity was under attack and that's why he put the knife in. Now, I don't know why he would have put the knife in, but that made me think back to a lot of kind of the very zero tolerance policies that were in place in like even my elementary school. And this was before Columbine. I don't even know what it's like now. But like I remember um, – I was given in the fourth, fourth or fifth grade, I was given a weapons charge for having a weapon at school and was nearly suspended and nearly expelled. Now, what was this weapon that I had at school? I had taken a paperclip and a rubber band and I was like a little technical kid, uh, very good at engineering. And I made myself a toy bow and arrow that shot pencils. 
Mm -hmm. And some friends were like, oh, that's really cool. Can you make one for me? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And I said, and I made like three of them. And then like uh, the teacher found out about them and they lost, you know, everybody lost their minds over this simple kid's toy. And I wound up, um, I, I was not expelled. I was not fully suspended, but I, I wound up having to miss field day and write an essay about why it was wrong for me to bring a weapon to school. So th this kind of extremely severe overreaction in the education system seems to be being taken advantage of by reactionaries to pull people over to their side. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, do you, can, do you have anything to respond to that on? Me? Yeah, yeah. I mean, totally. Um, and I mean, I remember that. And I remember being in, I think I was in fifth grade when the Columbine massacre happened. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, just, I mean, many stories of people I knew or things that went on where it was almost just like what you're describing, right? Or something that went on that was pretty innocent, that maybe at the most the teacher should have said, well, you should stop doing that because of our concerns, got turned into, oh my God, there's a terrorist threat. There's a, you know, and that, and that again, you probably have resentment. I would have resentment if something like that happened to me, you know? I, I did, mean, I don't know anymore. <laughs> right, but I would be angry about that. So then this, this, this woman comes along Right. And she says, see, this is feminism's fault. Yeah. You, you, you know what I mean? You want to hear it. Right. And that that I think that for men in particular, there are a lot of feelings that we have that the wider society, you know, society is moving in a direction of of maybe these feelings about making wanting to make a bow and arrow out of a out of a paper clip and, and whatever. It's like society is moving in a direction where some of the feelings that young boys when they're growing up or teenage boys have are increasingly you know, frowned upon and they have a resentment around it. And I think that, you know, gender in U.S. society is changing, right? I mean, the way gender roles are changing, there's a lot more women in college now. And, and you know, I mean, you know, women, I think there's more women than men in college, right? And that, that the way our, our society is changing in a lot of ways. Um, and as a result, I think there's a lot of confusion and I think there's a lot of frustration. And that, that seems, especially, you mentioned Jordan Peterson. That is like exactly the example. If you watch him, that is all he does. He knows exactly how certain people think. And he just gives voice to things people already feel. He gives voice to things they already feel. He gives voice to things they already feel. And then he tacks on this right wing garbage. Right. Yeah. And and yeah. a lot of times what these people feel like, you know, a guy being outraged that he politely asked a woman for a date. She said no. And then ran to her friends and tried to get to be the center of attention by saying he's a creeper. And, he, you know. I, being mad about that is justified, right? You know, you being mad about, you know, that is justified. But he taps into that anger, gives it validation and turns it into something it's not and directs it against cases that have nothing to do with what happened. You, you know, and that's that seems to be a common tactic. And that, that's every video I've ever watched by Jordan Peterson seems to be doing that on some level, at least. Um, and then he gets applause when he speaks to live crowds. He'll start out. He'll say, well, no, I know I'm not allowed to say that. And the audience goes, Ooh, he's not allowed to say it. You know, and it's this it's this kind of like weird resentment against certain aspects of of the liberal culture uh, that he taps into to push something far, far more vile than anything to do with the liberal culture. Um, yeah. I think that, that I saw, a, I saw a meme, of, by the way, which was um, if conservatives are being censored, then why won't they ever shut the fuck up? <laughs> that's a very good question. That's the, that's the funniest thing, man, because people like Jordan Peterson, Christina Hoff Summers, uh, Ben Shapiro and, and all their other ghoul ilk will always complain about how much they're being censored in some of the biggest media outlets on the planet. They'll write a New York Times op-ed that's like a page and a half long about how they can't say what they want to say, reaching millions of readers. And and people buy into it. And, it, it, it you know, uh, I marketing. think marketing marketing and, and I think anyone who's listening to this and I'm sure you two guys are familiar with um, Umberto Eco's uh, distinctive characteristics of fascism. And it, it plays into the obsession with a plot. They're always obsessed with a plot. And being obsessed with a plot, it actually kind of provides you an emotional outlet because – oh, I'm sorry. Uh, so, oh, I lost audio for a sec. Uh, it, it gives you an emotional outlet because it lets you act out the hero fantasy where you're the lone voice of reason fighting against this massive conspiracy of people who are out to destroy everything that you love. And it, it's very satisfying for people to put themselves in that role. And that's a really easy way to recruit people for far right ideology. Yeah, um, you know, I think a another aspect of it um, is that a lot of times they're not met with a response that yeah. if you're a Marxist, yeah. if you're a socialist, you can debunk this stuff. Right. Yeah. But 
a lot of what they're doing is they're playing into things that people kind of already believe in this society. Like, like classic. What is like, what does the alt-right constantly say? Communism is worse than fascism. That is one of their, their mantras, right? And as, as, as much as, you know, liberals wouldn't put it that way, they kind of believe that. Joe Biden thinks that, right? Yeah. Joe Biden thinks that. I've heard it said on CNN many times. So it's like, that's something that is already part of our discourse here in the United States. It's just, you know, not taken to its logical implication, right? If communism is worse than fascism, were we then on the wrong side of World War II? Shouldn't we then be outlawing communist groups, not Nazi groups? I mean, it's not taken to its full logical implication. The problem is it's false, right? It's false, right? The communists yeah. were heroic anti-fascists. They did amazing stuff. But if you accept that premise, which all of Western liberal society accepts, then why don't we take it to its logical conclusion? Another thing that I feel like the, the far right does, I was getting ready to say this before, is that I feel like that there are a lot of people that really have a desire to just be mean. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, yeah, a, a, lot of, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a lot of what their memes are, I don't see them as like ideological fascism or white nationalism or li even libertarianism. It's just there's a part of me deep down that's an asshole that just really wants to be nasty and rude to other people and not care about what they think. And being part of this alt-right internet community gives me the opportunity to be an asshole, right? And I can let the asshole side of myself fly. And that I think that increasingly we are, you know, in workplaces, in schools and stuff like that, emphasizing that people have to treat each other with respect, right? That you have to be careful when you're going to criticize someone else. You have to be polite about it, right? And that, that there's a part of people that are just, you know, they just want to be mean and nasty, right? And that, that this, this far right milieu gives them a place to let that out. Am I right about that? Yeah, I think you're very right about that. And also keep in mind, like, not only did, so not only does that happen, like with HR culture, but also you can see why they were able to piggyback off the skeptic me community and really like recruit a number of atheists who got tired of dunking on Christians and then decided to go in and start dump dunking on the SJWs. Um, because it, uh, part of the reason why some, some people went and identified as atheists was so they could say horrible, blasphemous things to Christians and still feel good about it. So I'm sorry, Bob, what were you going to say? Oh, I, w I was just about to agree with you. Uh, the HR culture was a brilliant point that you brought up there because you're right. You, you, you have a, a whole generation of people who are stuck in these dead end pointless jobs where they have to constantly kind of take abuse from the customers. They have to take abuse from their supervisors. They have no, they have no way to vent. They have no, there's no labor movement where they can, you know, organize against the bosses. They are, there's no, there's no telling somebody to fuck off if you work as a McDonald's employee and they have two, two less fries than they think they should. And you're right. It, it does provide them an outlet to be kind of mean uh, or to vent their frustrations with uh, the broader system that they don't really recognize as causing the problem in the first place. And, and that's, it's a great recruitment tool for them because they can just recruit all of these dissatisfied young people. Uh, primarily, of course, fascists tend to target dissatisfied young white men in this country. And yeah. Well, they're branching out. Now they're also getting dissatisfied young minorities. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, they, they one, are. Their ideology, I don't think, is going to hang on to those guys too much. One pattern um, that you will see, um, you know, and that people talk about this about, like, child abuse in, you know, like, working class families and that often, you know, uh, you'll see a parent, be, you know, start being being harsh to their child, being mean to their child and saying something to the effect of like, they, my child needs to understand how bad the world really is. Right. That's kind of a, a common theme. You know, um, you know, I remember when I was in Cleveland, I was selling communist newspapers and I had something about LGBT rights in it. And I remember somebody, you know, somebody said to me, uh, you know, well, you know, it was a person of color, you know, a black man said to me. You know, if, if I had a son who was gay, I would, you know, punch him in the face every day until he got tough and wasn't, you know, gay anymore. That's awful. I mean, you hear these things, they're awful, but it's kind of like there's this, 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 you know, there is a harshness to working class life, right? Like, you know, you know, I mean, you know, if you're in a school that has metal detectors where the police are searching it every day, where if you say the wrong thing, if you get into a fist fight, you're not going to go get sent to the principal's office, you're going to go to jail. The world is a lot harsher. Um, and I think that, this kind of be super nice to people, this kind of ultra politeness is kind of a more middle class trend. Um, you know, and I think that that there are people who perhaps their reality, the, the world that they grow up in, is more working class and more harsh and more gruff 
And they they have this they, they then get into an atmosphere where all of a sudden now, you know, we're going to be really, really nice to each other. And, you know, before we criticize someone, we're going to give them a compliment beforehand and a compliment afterwards so it doesn't hurt them as much. And, and they get into that atmosphere and they're just like, no, this isn't how I, it, you know, and it's not how they grew up. And like that's kind of that's kind of like what, you know, people who have have worked in council kind of low income parents will often say. The low income parent is being harsh to their child because they want their child to understand how bad the world really is. Well, you know, really, yeah, is that really the parent's role? Right. What the I would say. Yeah. The attitude should be you should you should want your child to not have to experience the world being that better. And you should want your child to when they face such hardship to respond to it in a way where they don't escalate. And, you know, but it's just kind of it's 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 all of this and that there is a middle class vibe to a lot of liberal things. Right. That's a long trope of the right. You know, the you know, the right tries to be you know we're for the average man who goes hunting and and you know you know you know goes hunting and fishing and you know lives in the country and all of that and liberals are driving suvs and drinking lattes and they're elites and they live in this world and and that's kind of become you know like a, a theme of like the mainstream neocon right is that we're for average white working people right whereas whereas it's those liberal elites that don't understand our life and i think i think that despite the fact that that's all, you know, they're cutting the wages of low income people. Right. And that they're on top of that, you know, there's a lot of people in this country that are working class that aren't white. And, and, you know, they're only talking about white working class people. So it's got a racial edge to it, but there is a class resentment, I think on some level that, that the, the alt-right element feeds into and that this mean that they, they just jump on top of, they love that meanness. They love that cruelty that, that, that has a class edge to it. I mean, maybe I'm not making any sense here, but uh, am, no, no, I, I think you definitely are. Yeah. It, 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 it does. And, you know, where, 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 where we get our culture from matters, too, because, again, you have a couple of generations coming up where their parents didn't really have time to raise them because our society is so atomized from the failure of neoliberal capitalism that uh, generations of young men have gotten their ideas of what it means to be a man and what it means to be masculine from watching like action movies, watching hero fantasies. And they see the right kind of fetishizing uh, masculinity and they see the right kind of fetishizing strength. And they, they don't have that in their life because, again, they're stuck in these dead-end jobs where they can't be mean to anybody. They have no way to vent. And then they see the right fetishizing these things that they want to express because this is the culture that they've been brought up with. They've been brought up with, like, you know, Schwarzenegger's commando. You, you get a problem, you, you gun down 150 people, and you're, you're the strong hero. And you see people like Trump as a symptom of this because he completely fetishizes masculinity and he completely fetishizes just like the idea of being strong without actually having to be strong or be masculine, which is another thing that kind of attracts people to these far right ideas is that you're the gr great hero of your story, but you're also not in any actual danger. You're not actually putting yourself out there. You're arguing essentially for the status quo and you're just couching it in this fetishization of a, a masculinity that's never really existed. Yeah, it's really interesting too, like, because, you know, if somebody, like, if a far right guy is coming after me, yeah. um, it, what's always interesting is, is that they'll, they'll call me like a soy boy. Oh, yeah, I get that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm like I get... a freaking mountain climbing black belt who fights bare knuckle. <laughs> Dude, I'm, 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 I'm a literal, I'm a literal combat vet, and I get that, man. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and they, they'll be like, soy boy, and you're just like, really, dude? <laughs> and I, I feel like a lot of this is... There is a lot of insecurity. It's got to be insecurity in their own masculinity, and that's really a, a product of fascism. I was just actually reading about the authoritarian mindset uh, put out by I think was Adorno behind one of the people behind that. I, I think he, he that was that was Frankfurt School, so I, I wouldn't be surprised yeah. if it was the actual uh, Frankfurt School, by the way, not the not, not the five Jew bankers, you know, no, uh, no. <laughs> Frankfurt School. But yeah, I, I was I was reading about the Frankfurt the actual Frankfurt School's history. And they did a thing on like the fascist personality type and a big part of being a fascist is projecting your own fears and hatreds and self-hatred onto others. Yeah, you, and you, so, you should take the uh, personality quiz that oh, the I scale test. Yeah, well, it, it's, I, a, it, it's trippy. I, I don't I'm not a big fan of that stuff, honestly. Um, and I think that that some of that is is a bit of a problem because I think. 90% of the human race is a fascist, according to Adorno. I mean, you know, and <laughs> yeah. he's trying to pick apart aspects of the human psyche that he deems to be authoritarian. Um, I, I, I don't know. And I feel like that, you know, when fascism stops being fascism, when it starts being, you know, people that, uh, that I mean, like, 
the, the quiz, it's like you don't like ambiguity, for example. That makes you a fascist. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, it's like almost like everyone has a little bit of a fascist inside of them, and we have to like cure them and make them the perfect, you know, like open minded liberal. You know, I, I, would, I mean, I, I, I would yeah. say that that's kind of the point that he was making. It's not that necessarily everyone is a fascist, it's that everyone has like uh, certain personality traits and certain ideas that make them uh, potentially recruitable by fascists if their ideas are couched in a certain way. Like, uh, like, like German, Germany was a, a nation of, of culture for like a thousand years with a, a very rich, very uh, deep intellectual culture. And the fascists played on a lot of that tradition to recruit people who otherwise wouldn't agree with their ideology. And that, 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 that I think is the point that Adorno was making. And you also have to take into account that uh, Adorno's uh, main goal for politics in general was to prevent another Auschwitz, which I think is a absolutely um, cornerstone goal. goal. Yeah, that should that should be for everybody. It's to prevent any kind of camp from ever being built again. Uh, we don't always succeed in that. Of course, we see things happening today, but uh, that that's I think it's very informative um, when you realize that fascists aren't just some like mustache twirling evil guy in the background. They they're playing on traits that we get just from being in, in society and just potential values that we might have in the West or anywhere, really. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask you, Caleb, because this is something in, uh, you know, the Frankfurt School is not something that I know a lot about. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, I think Bob is the only person I've known that's actually read some of these authors. Um, <laughs> Like, because they're dense and weird um, and, and, and depressing. 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 Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad we both came to that. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, from what I've been led to understand, because I started hearing about, like, the Frankfurt School from crazy right-wing people. And uh, we got stuff like, uh, it, it struck me initially, because I never heard anything about it at Occupy, that it was something like, like Saul Alinsky, where it's something that people on the right think is very influential on the left, but isn't actually very influential unless you like a very specific kind of thing. And I, I know that the uh, communists uh, in particular uh, really um, opposed Adorno. In fact, like communist students organized against him and stopped him from speaking a number of times. Can you kind of go into the history there and unpack that for us? Well, right. I mean, that's that's the whole point is that that, you know, that stuff is very influential among academic Marxists and mm -hmm. academia in general. But it's very, very anti-communist. I mean, it sees the Soviet Union. I mean, that's, I mean, his book, The Authoritarian Personality, um, a lot of this stuff, you know, saw the Soviet Union as equivalently fascist to to Nazi Germany, right? And that's Which is what we I, started off saying is uh, really wrong. <laughs> yeah, and that's, yeah. that's where well, I take issue with a lot of the Frankfurt School. And there's a reason that stuff was covertly funded by the U.S. intelligence agencies, by British intelligence. And with Adorno, that's it's pretty well documented. He wrote for... Partisan Review Magazine, which was a CIA operation, and and it was about pulling progressive-minded, you know, leftist intellectuals away from Marxism, Leninism, and communist groups. Like that was it was a barrier that was created, and there was a lot of research done against like quote unquote authoritarianism and stuff by the CIA in the late uh, in in the late fifties and such. That was about kind of how do we prevent young intellectuals and young people that are maybe interested in civil rights and opposing the Vietnam War from becoming communists? And how can we create this new left uh, that is that is neither pro-Soviet uh, nor right-wing, that, that we can create this way that you can be left-wing in the Western world without being a communist? And that's the Frankfurt School in a lot of ways. It was cultural criticism. Herbert Marcuse uh, was, was the big intellectual, I believe, who's associated with them. Uh, uh, Mar Mar Marcuse was the French intellectualist. Uh, the Frankfurt School guys were mostly German. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but, so, but I, yeah. I, I would I would push back a little bit on um, uh, Adorno saying that the Soviet Union was equivalently fascist. He his issue was the uh, the authoritarianism of uh, Stalin and uh, the later Marxist Leninists. Uh, he 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 would argue that uh, authoritarianism, uh, extreme authoritarianism in any form, is an undesirable social outcome, and that that's something I would absolutely agree with. And you, you're right, though. Uh, a lot of things um, in contemporary theory have been misappropriated in the last uh, few decades since they were written. But uh, I don't think it's fair to say that he thought that um, the Soviet Union was equivalently fascist to Nazi Germany. Yeah, mm. I'm, I don't know one way or the other, but I didn't mean to open a can of worms. Yeah, that's, well, that's, that's, that's an entirely different conversation. Yeah, and that's my criticism, though, of the authoritarian personality, is that yeah. you're right, Nazis did all the things he describes in the book. 
so yeah. did communists, so did Christians, so yeah. did any mass political movement. And that basically he's saying you should not have a mass political movement. Uh, you should I, just think for yourself and there should be free ideas and we need to take everything apart. And truth comes through deconstruction and that actually believing in things and having principles is in and of itself a bad thing. That that school of thought I take issue with. And I feel like that that's kind of like that. That is what is feeding these fascist ideas, because if you tell people not to believe in anything, people believe in stuff. They need truth. They need principles. They need something to believe in. And if you just tear down every statue, pretty soon people are going to be building statues and they're not going to be statues you want. You know, I, I, I feel like the issue in our modern time isn't that ideology itself is a problem, is that, the, is that people are looking for ideology and the only ideology that's out there is fascistic and far right and free market stuff. Um, and that's where I differ with, you know, the mainstream currents of the left that favor purely deconstruction. Does that make sense? It, it does. And, and you're, you're describing Marcuse and um, Derrida again a little bit um, more than Adorno, because the, the Frankfurt School, uh, they were classicists and uh, the, the essence of bourgeois intellectuals, of course. So they, they were they did have a, a disdain for mass culture. Uh, mass political movements, not as much, I would say. But again, that, that's an entirely different conversation. You are, I would say, uh, really dead on when you when you describe the current society not being able to uh, um, understand ideology or see ideology uh, in rhetoric. And I think that's a serious problem that we're dealing with with alt-right people who I would say are objectively fascist in their ideology and actual neo-fascists in, in uh, America because we, we don't see their ideology. We see how they're presented. And when they're presented as good television on um, mainstream news networks, not just Fox News, not just OANN, but like Richard Spencer, I believe, was on uh, CNN or MSNBC a couple times because he was the Nazi in a suit with a nice haircut. And, and when people just see that and they don't see the underlying ideology because they're not educated in ideology by our public schools, which is a good point that you guys hit on a minute ago, and when they're not educated on the economic issues uh, that affect everybody in this weird atomized lib neoliberal society that we're living in, and they can't identify ideology, they just go for the emotional release. And they just go for the emotional release of far-right ideas, and that's how you get these, like, you know, 16-year-old gamer kids who don't know what fascism is or don't know what Pinochet actually did spamming helicopter memes. Uh, it, it's a great emotional release. I'm, I'm opposing these nasty commies. There aren't people. Uh, I'm, I'm opposing this SJW conspiracy. I'm opposing this cultural Marxist conspiracy, which is literally a Nazi talking point. Yeah. Uh, Which, yeah. by the way, on that, what's really interesting, there's two things I noticed. Um, first off, it's very interesting that we're having this conversation about like the actual Frankfurt School, because Jordan yeah. Peterson would say that literally like the Frankfurt School was the the way for the USSR to worm its way into yeah. American society and take no, over that way. Yeah. yeah. And, and then the other thing that I found really interesting is, is what you mentioned, Caleb, where um, the, the connection with the CIA, because this has me going back. There's a, there's an essay you should all get a chance to check out. Um, and anybody who is suspicious of right wing libertarians to check this out. It's called like um, Radicals, Imbeciles and FBI Stooges. <laughs> I've read um, that. Yeah, it's from Exiled Online, and it deals with the Yippies, which is why I was interested in it, because, you know, I did a lot with the very last of the Yippies. Um, but there was a group called the Hunter College Libertarians that put out a pamphlet in, like, the late 60s, early 70s, when, when Richard Nixon was president. And um, it literally advocated shooting Richard Nixon. It, it advocated killing the president in this thing, supposedly from these Hunter College libertarians. Um, and the thing was, was that when this flyer was shown to the FBI, the FBI said, we don't care about this. We have no, and what it, the article hints at uh, is stuff like Samuel Ed, Edward Konkin III, who's the founder of, um, oh, what's the, What's the fake anarchist ideology where it's about being somebody's weird uncle that smells like cheese and sells stuff on eBay and buys drugs on? Uh... You're, you're just describing libertarianism. You know? <laughs> yeah, but no, no, there's a specific term for it. They use like the anarchist flag, but instead of red, it's it's gray. Um, uh... I, I don't know. I don't know that one. And I'm like intensely political. Yeah, I'm trying. I, I know it. I just can't think of the term for it. But basically, it's. Uh, buying drugs and not paying your taxes as an ideology um, <laughs> was started by the Samuel Edward Konkin III, S-E-K-3, uh, or S yeah, S -E -K yeah, S-E-K, yeah, S-E-K-3. Um, and anyway, like, uh, basically, 
what you find is the U.S. government kind of looked at Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin and exploited the kind of Rubin-esque um, thing to uh, create right libertarianism. And to take these people who would be normally attracted to becoming anarchists, left anarchists, and funnel them in a way to where they would essentially be harmless to the system itself. And simultaneously, they would then take right uh, traditional left libertarian arguments against tyranny and target them at Marxists. So it's like a way of, of destroying one camp of the left by making everyone by uh, means of uh, making everyone think that, oh, no, this is actually the left. Yeah. And then the other left gets suppressed using like that left's corpse. You, you can always pay one half of the poor to kill the other half. Exactly. Well, there, there's many layers to this. I mean, yeah. if you read about Operation Gladio uh, in Italy, you know, during the 1950s and 60s and 70s, it was like, you know, the Italian Communist Party, because it had resisted Mussolini, was very, very, very popular and was probably going to win the elections. So the CIA had a whole program dedicated to keeping the Italian communists from winning the elections and bringing Italy into the pro-Soviet camp. And part of the program was arming fascists to go out and kill communists. That was like the first stage. But then they realized that that kind of created sympathy for communists, and they kept doing that. But then they also started funding these crazy ultra-left communists that would do bombing campaigns and terrorist acts that would then people would identify with the Communist Party so they wouldn't vote for the communists, right? And so there was this whole period in Italian history they called the years of lead, where it was like fascists and communists blowing things up and shooting each other. And it was all kind of orchestrated by the CIA to prevent the legal Italian Communist Party from getting elected. And then here's what's really wild. It didn't work, right? The Italian Communist Party continued to grow and get popular. The way they ultimately defeated the Italian Communist Party was by funding it. Right. And and in the, the 70s, they started giving grant money to college professors uh, that were in the Italian Communist Party, paying them to write stuff that was like pushing the envelope and getting more and more critical of the USSR until eventually in 1978, the Italian Communist Party, the Spanish Communist Party and the um, the uh, the French Communist Party, they got together and signed a document denouncing the USSR, calling themselves Euro communists. Right. And. Eventually, I think a few years later, the Italian Communist Party dissolved and became the Democratic Party of the left. Some of the recent prime ministers of Italy have been from the Democratic Party of the left. It's just a normal, you know, liberal, you know, kind of I mean, they're not they're not far right. But, you know, I mean, they're just kind of like it's almost like the, the Democrats or the, the, the Labour Party in Britain. It's just kind of turned into nothing. Right. Um, and that there was this whole effort to kind of manipulate things in Italy to hurt the Communist Party, to keep Italy in the in the U.S. camp during the Cold War. And that involved all kinds of manipulation um, and that that, you know, what you're describing with these anarchists and the FBI writing pamphlets and trying to push anarchism in a certain direction. There's so much of that that goes on. It's wild. It's really, really, really wild. And if you look at the history of the Cold War, it's like it, it gets really, really crazy. Um, there's an individual by the name of Francis Parker Yaki, and he was a neo a, a Nazi. Right. He was a Nazi sympathizer during World War Two. After World War II, he was like going around Europe, meeting with ex-Nazis, trying to form, you know, uh, pro-Soviet or trying to form like, you know, new Nazi groups after World War II. In, in this early 60s, he came to the conclusion that the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union was somehow a good representation of fascism. Right. And so he started working first with like Arab nationalists that were anti-Semitic. And then he like went to Cuba and tried to meet with Fidel. And you had this guy who basically we don't know if he. We don't know exactly when he at the time of his death, he had like 15 different passports. Right. He was traveling all over the world under different names. He was a Nazi, but he in his mind to be a true Nazi meant to support the Soviet Union. And he was doing all kinds of covert work, trying to manipulate, you know, uh, communists uh, to, to support Nazis or something and trying to like tie Nazi groups to the Soviet to the Soviet Union or something. He, I mean, it, it's really wild. I mean, the, the, the spy versus spy stuff that went on during the Cold War, when it was like, it was supposed to be, yeah, the USA was against communism, the, Soviet was, the Soviets were for communism. But by the end of the Cold War, with like China was aligning with the United States and all these African countries, and, and you had the Euro communists, and, and it got so messy and confusing that there were, you know, there were far-right people that were aligned with the Soviet Union, 
There were, you know, left wing communists that were aligned and covertly supported by the CIA. There was everything in between and everything vice versa. And it was a complete mess. And geopolitics can be like that, unfortunately. You know what I'm saying? Well, um, it, it reminds me of what Orwell said when he first got to Spain. He thought the country was under attack by initials because of all the party. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's kind of something, too, that winds up attracting people to the right is that the right offers a very, very simple narrative of what's going on in the world. And the left usually uh, does a very complicated analysis of the actual complexities that are going on in the world. So it's kind of a problem for everybody on the left is that we have these narratives that are, are backed up by, you know, scientific economics, by culture, by, by just basically the sum total of global thought for the last few, few decades. But, you know, you have to explain these very complicated academic ideas to somebody who's getting like – they're coming for your video games or they're, they're coming for the white race or, you know, it, it, or the Disney put a black princess in a movie for um, capitalist reasons to make a profit. But, you know, that's literally white genocide. You know, it, it, these are very simple narratives that they can recruit these guys with. And it's it's very simple narratives to spam on online forums or just to just to put out there on, on cable news. You know, this actually gets back to something Sargon said in his debate with me. That was one of the, it was like one of the, it had nothing to do with the topic, but it was one of the points he actually made that I was like, hmm, like maybe I haven't thought about this enough. And basically his point was like, what about the stupid people? And I'm like, what do you mean, what about the stupid people? And he's like, yeah, the, the way he was kind of putting it was we, we can't deconstruct the concept of gender because these people rely on the concept of gender and they'll, the, they won't they will understand what's going on. I'm like, what? They're like not going to know. Like, they're just going to be like, oh, my God, trans people exist. Now I can't find a wife. Ah! But and that's ridiculous. But, you know, at the same time, it does seem like the fascist people and even I think Mike Enoch in the debate started to say, like, you know, I when I mocked him and Eric for being. kind of relates to that and you see this with so many of these alt-right communities is that you know people have these you know stupidities i guess you could call them right i'm um and what the internet has done is it's enabled people to people who may have had these stupidities like they feel like they're you know incels right they feel like they're persecuted by women because they can't have sex and so they feel pers you know instead of just kind of feeling that way moving on with life getting over it they find a community of people who feel the same way and then they all start feeding each other and then, mm -hmm. you know, when people have kind of an insane or delusional narrative, if they go and find other people who have a very similar insane delusional narrative and they start feeding each other's narratives and that they, and then it becomes part of their identity and then this is their community and then they have friends who are part of it and, and the Internet does that. And that a lot of things that are just kind of aspects of the human mind that, you know, you know, racism, right, bigotry, a lot of people are bigoted, right? But now with the internet, it's like, you're a bigot, I'm a bigot. Oh, wow, and it's so hard to be a bigot. And, and aren't you mad about the princess in the Disney movie? And I, it, it, it's like the internet gives people the ability to have, to have these defects or these quirks or these ways of thinking that are backward or problematic to build whole communities around them, to build echo chambers around them, to only hear people who agree with them, to become really bogged down, to make this a big part of their identity. Whereas before it would just kind of be an aspect of them that they just had, you know, you'd be like, I mean, yeah, oh, that guy's weird. Yeah, yeah. and I, I, I wanted to touch on the the topic of uh, the quote unquote stupid people. Um, I, I think that's a really reductive way of referring to people who don't really like reading dense theory. But it also is a <laughs> fundamental difference. It's a fundamental difference ultimately between the right and the left is that the the extreme left ultimately wants to abolish hierarchy. And they ultimately want to build everybody up so they can participate in dialectics, so they can understand uh, complicated ideas, so they can understand the system they live in. Whereas the right wants to use the – you're right to say that uh, the right wants to use those stupid people to their own ends. They want to keep those people stupid. They want to establish a hierarchy where they're the self-appointed aristocrats ruling over everybody with their superior brain power or whatever in the case of the, you know, the early pipeline. And then in the later pipeline, that idea lends itself extraordinarily, excuse me, extraordinarily well 
to people who want to uh, establish a racial hierarchy. So it's it feeds itself. Uh, you, you, you're the really smart guy. You're the smart guy because you're white. The white the white smart mm-hmm. people should rule over all of the other people. And it, it's this pipeline that you see. And again, it's a very very simple narrative. Uh, it's it's simple to deconstruct. It's simple to break down. It's simple to show the monstrous absurdity of that argument. But you have to be grounded in a little bit more uh, of a complex uh, background in theory or complex background in philosophy or complex background in economics to debunk that. And people stop listening once you start explaining like labor theory of value. People stop listening when you explain cultural criticism. People stop listening when you start talking about the the giant capitalist culture industry that we've built that just replicates itself over and over again. Uh, and yeah. well, it's, whereas... it's the Jesse Lee Peterson thing that Caleb, you brought this up on a stream with me earlier where they'll say like, Oh, um, uh, like one of the, one of the nasty comments that was left on my capitalism debate, my most recent one was, it was like, Oh, this guy wants to give empty homes to homeless people. That's done. Don't listen to a thing he has to say. That's all you need to know. You know, it's like one aspect where like Jesse Lee Peterson will say, Oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm from Kentucky. I rest my case. You know, it's like a a thought terminating cliche that comes completely out of nowhere. Yeah. And appealing to quote unquote common sense. You know, there's a lot of folk wisdom and common sense and things people just, just know, you know what I'm saying? And, and a lot of that is things, there's mythology to uphold our existing society, right? A lot of this witticism that people say, you know, this common knowledge that people just know these things people say that they just repeat a lot of it is not true, and it's just kind of things that were people made up in order to justify the society. Um, and the problem is, though, uh, if you're going to deconstruct that, people feel like their identity is under attack. Um, and if you don't give them something simple that they can replace it with, if what you're replacing it with is much more complex and hard to understand, uh, people will divert to what's easier, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. What's easier and what they know. Um, and I think that that can be part of the problem is if you're expecting everyone to adopt a very, very complex worldview in which there's shades of gray in which there's nuance in which everything is not simple. I mean, that seems to be the biggest problem I see is that no one is capable of understanding nuance. Right. I mean, you know, I mean, earlier, you know, I mean, we were talking about how awful Jordan Peterson is, but I think we are. anything they ever did again they're jordan peterson fans i see that kind of stuff on the internet all the time these broad sweeping statements when what we said was jordan peterson is very skilled at presenting his views and he's very bad and here's an but it's like people don't want that's too complicated right people are just good or bad there are good people there are bad people there there's no nuance there's no complexity to anything and people don't really want to learn anything because you know to really understand the world to understand the nuance you have to be learning Right. You have to be challenging your previous assumptions. You have to be recognizing, um, you know, I really like Thomas Carlyle. He's a writer. um, You know, he wrote on heroes and hero worship in history. And one of the things he wrote about was he talked about how, you know, you can learn something from every major religion because Mm -hmm. it wouldn't have become a major religion if it didn't have some aspect of truth in it. Right. Millions of people wouldn't follow, you know, some religion if it if it had no aspect of truth, it wasn't speaking to some higher truth. Right. And that if you know that that you have to look at these things in a nuanced way, you know, Jordan Peterson is awful. We can agree. But why? Why does he attract such a good following? Is there something he says that touches the people? What, what can we learn from that? And what can we use? You know, I mean, you know, that's that's the kind of thinking you have to develop if you really want to change the world. A lot of people don't want that. They want someone to tell them who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. They're on the winning team. They're on the good team. And they just want to go on with their life. And that's problematic because the world is much more complicated than that. I would agree with you 100% on that. Um, I guess on that, uh, Bob, do you have anything else you want to plug in upcoming? Um, uh, do you have a new uh, podcast coming out? 